Hey folks, welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to look at the concurrency problems when it comes to databases. What are the anomalies that happen, that may happen, and that will break your application? So that may break your consistency, you know, the understanding of your transactions you're doing, and it will cause some serious problems that are difficult to reason about. You might have seen whenever we talk about transactional relational databases, we talk about asset properties, right? Atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. So this isolation here, that databases have multiple isolation levels, and this isolation guarantees that two transactions that you're running on your database have complete isolation, as if they are, there's no other transaction, right? And this is done to ensure these anomalies that we are going to talk about do not happen because there, there can be serious problems if these anomalies occurs. But still, not every operation needs this kind of isolation where it only has one transaction and you know they occur in a strictly serializable manner where one happens after the other. So this is not the topic for today. We are going to talk about the isolation levels in the next video. But for today, let's talk about the problems that may happen if concurrency is not dealt with in the right manner. Also from the application's perspective. But before we start though, if you haven't joined the membership of the channel yet, please consider joining so you can get access to all these videos, database internals, JVM internals, and other topics that are coming up. So please consider joining and let's get started. Cool, so the first one is the traditional locking problem, like understand uh, what happens when multiple transactions are running, right? So let's say you have multiple transactions. Uh, this transaction starts here, and this is the time timeline of the transactions. It starts, it updates a row, and then another transaction begins at this point. And since it is updating the row, and we take a lock to avoid any problems with the data, what we do is we take a lock. So this begins, it tries to select a row, but this is blocked because we have taken a lock, okay? And the first transaction then commits here, and now is the time when the transaction two can proceed. The problem is you see, at this point, even if this transaction was only reading the row, may have been just fine uh, with whatever is going on with the transaction one, we still blocked it, right? Which means there might be some performance issues in some specific workload. So, this is fine when you need like strict serializable guarantees, you just take a lock, let the transaction one complete its workflow, and then let the transaction two begin. But not all transactional workloads, you know, need this kind of strict behavior. So as you can see, this blocked access to that particular row can create some problems when it comes to performance, right? Um, <clears throat> readers and writers both block each other because, you know, you take locks on the row and one transaction must wait before the other one releases the lock. Now, the performance problem when you have like multiple threads, as you can see, that there is one shared resource and you know there are multiple transactions. And one of them will win. Let's say the lock is acquired by some other transaction. All these transactions will have to wait, even if, let's say, 80% or even 90% in a typical scenario, uh, you just want to read a row, right? You don't want to change anything. So even then, it will be blocked, and uh, yeah, it may it may create some performance problems depending on what you're trying to do. So yeah, it, the problems are low throughput. There are you know transactions queued. It may time out, uh, high latency, like long wait times. There's always a deadlock risk whenever locks are involved, and this solution is not really scalable. Uh, but these are like transactional locking mechanisms, uh, just to understand why we need some sort of concurrency in the first place, okay? And uh, there are multiple ways, like for example, Postgres uses uh, MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, which we'll talk about in another video. Uh, but yeah, this is just to understand why locks are taken, what problems they create, and what problems they try to avoid in the first place, right? Which are the concurrency anomalies. So, <clears throat> the first one, the lost update problem. So let's say, again, you have multiple transactions. The initial state says that the account balance is 1000. And 
this, let's say, this is when you allow multiple transactions to run. So let's say the transaction one reads the balance. It says, okay, the balance is 1000, which is correct. At the same time, the transaction two also reads a balance and it also gets 1000, all fine. The transaction one writes a new balance, which is it adds 100 to the existing balance. It gets 1100. Transaction two is still working with 1000 and it subtracts 200 from the balance. So the new value is 800. And then they both try to write it. Now somehow the database writes 800, let's say this transaction wins. So we have lost an update of this $100, and which is a huge problem when it comes to financial databases. So if you allow this behavior where multiple transactions can just do whatever they want at the same time in concurrent manner and update so whoever wins, you don't know, you cannot reason about, and you will have a problem of lost update. So as you can clearly see, this is a serious problem. So we need some sort of isolation. So the first problem, lost update, is a critical one. <clears throat> the second problem, it's about dirty reads. So the first one was a like a write anomaly. And the second one is a read anomaly, where you know you read something, but it does not make sense. Why? Let's see. So let's say there's again a timeline. The transaction one begins and uh, it you know, updates the price from 100 to 200. Now here, the transaction two begins uh, and it reads the price 200, okay? Because it has updated it. And the read price, it reads is 200, but then transaction one fails because of some reason. So whatever transaction two has, or uh, yeah, transaction two has read, it was like a partial state and now that partial state is gone. So which means it has read something that does not exist anymore because transaction one rolled back. So it is a problem because it is working on a partial state, which means you cannot explain this behavior. Like how come it is reading 200 and let's say it is doing something plus 200 or something, right? So how come the overall balance without this transaction completing reaches a state which can never exist? So the math is not mathing. So the problem is the transaction two reads uncommitted data, right? So this transaction didn't commit. It was just writing some partial entries while working on the transaction. And this guy read this partial state and it created some state which does not exist. So <clears throat> yeah, uncommitted state should not be read. So this is the second dirty read anomaly which can happen and it's really hard to debug or reason about it. It's nearly impossible. Okay, so the problem of non-repeatable read, and this is another critical one, and what it says is, you know, of course, the name is pretty good, non-repeatable, so let's say you are running a transaction, and uh, you make a query, okay? So let's let's see here what, what's happening. So you create a transaction, it begins, and it selects quantity, and uh, it reads 100, okay? Now, there is second transaction, which begins and updates the quantity to 50. So half of it is gone and it commits, right? Now when the transaction one tries to do the same query again, it gets 50 because of course this transaction is committed, but in the same transaction scope, the same queries are returning different data, which means the consistency within a transaction is lost. And depending on what you're doing, it may have serious problems, for example, you run a uh, like a, a report of your, I don't know, sales or something. And then you say, okay, get me all the transactions and you want to do a sum on all categories, okay? And you get some 1000 or something like that. Now here, uh, in between, you also do, okay, sum and then group by category, okay? So the category of product. At the end, even if you're doing a group by doing something else, the total sum should match. But here it is 1000 and someone else adds it or removes something and let's say it is 1200. Now within your transaction, you cannot verify this is correct and it may fail or it may cause some inconsistency. So non-repeatable read is a problem within transaction scope. The same query should give you the same result. And that's why people prefer working with a single snapshot of data, which will give them consistent results for the entire transaction, okay? 
So this is the problem of non-repeatable read, where in given transaction scope, you get different results, which may lead to inconsistency and problems that are really difficult to explain what is happening. So the same query in transaction one return different results, no consistent view of data within a transaction. And it is a problem as you can see here. So you cannot verify uh, whatever you're doing if you're running uh, longer transactions and it is a problem. <clears throat> Phantom reads, right? This is an interesting one. So let's say you run a transaction, it begins and it uh, select count where age greater than 30, it gives you five rows, okay? Now transaction two begins and it inserts new, let's say age 35 and it commits the transaction. Now here, it results into six rows when you try to you know, run the queries again. So this match or this result does not match with this result, which means there are some new rows added within while the transaction was running and you have no clue what's, what's happening. So these are like phantom rows where you know, a transaction that has committed results into some new rows being added to your result which can create problems because uh, you may want to do something based on the number of rows you get. For example, you have a booking uh, or a meeting room management system and you say between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. give me all the meetings for a given room, right? Now at this point, it says, okay, zero. And then there is another request. Someone else tries to book something and they book a meeting here. Now, when you run, run the same query again, you get one. So somehow this row was inserted and you're working with something that is no longer true, right? Because new rows are inserted. So it's a problem depending on what you're doing. <clears throat> it's a serious problem when it comes to reporting, when it comes to, you know, conditional logic as in number of rows, number of categories where, uh, you know, you depend on a number of rows and inserting new rows creates a problem or you're depending on a sum or something like that, right? So this is a problem. So this is another anomaly which may happen, and again, very difficult to reason about. Right skew, and this is an interesting problem. So let's say we typically go on call in our teams, right? And uh, the expected state is, like this is the constraint, like at least one engineer must be on call, okay? So what happens, initial state, okay, Alice is on call, and Bob is on call, which is okay, while they are you know, changing the shift or whatever, it is fine to have more number of on-call engineers, but at least one is the constraint. So at this point, constraint is okay. Transaction two or transaction one, Alice, uh, you know, reads that, okay, Bob is on-call, yes. So safe to go off-call. So Alice thinks, okay, I can go off-call because Bob is there and, you know, he can take care of the on-call without breaking the constraint. Meanwhile, Bob also reads that, okay, Alice is on call and, you know, I can safely go off call. Both of them go off call and commit the transaction. As a result, the final state is problematic, breaking the constraint. So you have no coverage for your on call, which is a serious problem, right? So this happens because, you know, both of them are working with a state uh, which has changed concurrently and it creates a right skew and this is a serious problem. And this can be, you know, resolved using a serializable transaction mechanism where Alice, if she's trying to update something, she must see that, okay, now Bob has also gone off call. So my previous state is incorrect and I, I cannot go off call anymore or vice versa. So these are real problems as we saw and it creates a ton of consistency problems when it comes to data, you may have data corruption and so on. So that's the reason whenever we have, let's say databases, you cannot just have one process or thread working with the database because that's just too slow. And in real world concurrent environment, it may not just work. So you need multiple threads and processes running in a database and so at, at times they will work with the same rows, okay? So let's say you have rows and this is the row and there can be multiple threads working, trying to do something or a set of rows, you know, and it can create these problems. So concurrency is important to get good performance, good throughput, uh, but with concurrency, we have all these anomalies and that's why 
transaction isolation is so important and different databases do it differently. There are multiple levels as we talked about here. And uh, you know, there are uh, read uncommitted, read committed, uh, repeatable read, serializable, and so on. For example, Postgres implement uh, MVCC based uh, snapshots and on top of snapshot, it creates a serializable snapshot isolation, which is a special mechanism which tries to get the best of both uh, optimistic and pessimistic locking. But MySQL uh, using InnoDB, it uses pessimistic locking for serializable mode. So we'll talk about that later, but I hope this concurrency anomalies make sense. And I hope that you never get into these problems and you always use the right isolation level for your workload, right? So more on that later, but if you like this episode, please hit the like button, share your thoughts in the comments. If you have ever faced any of these anomalies, share it in the comments, and I would be happy to learn more about it. And until next video, enjoy. Thank you.